Hello and welcome to Go With The Heat. I'm Dominic. And I'm John. I'm Melissa. And this is your cultural guy. It's a phenomenon that was Miami Vice. Hey, you know what? You want to hear something that we've never talked about before? Melissa's on the road. <laughs> on location in Northern yes. California. Yes, I am. <laughs> she couldn't wait to be part of this episode. She's on the road. She's helping out some family, but... Had to be here for Callous of October. Of course. (laughs) How could I miss this episode? Bull semen is a special interest of mine. (laughs) Uh, uh, I've studied it for years. (laughs) This is, of course, season four, episode 12, titled The Callous of October. It originally premiered on February 5th, 1988. It is written by Ed Zuckerman, who uh, didn't write anything else for Vice, but did write a lot of stuff. For JAG, Star Trek The Next Generation, and Law and Order, including producing like 41 episodes of Law and Order. I like this really? guy. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, according to the rest of his work, he doesn't know how to have a good time. Unlike this episode. I can get down on some JAG like 4 o'clock in the morning. You know when it's on. <laughs> you just flip it over to Ion and there it is just waiting for you. Yep. <laughs> the director is Vern Gillum. He also directed Child's Play. Let that sink in for a minute. And then uh-huh. he's also got he's also got three more coming. So get used to Vern Gillum. Although I'm <laughs> pretty sure based on that name, it's a pseudonym. <laughs> <laughs> no one's taking credit for this week again? Okay. We're crediting out the pseudonyms, guys. <laughs> All right, John. I'm not going to give anything away. But this is probably the hardest you've ever had to work for a music segment. This is the most important music segment we've ever had. These are possibly the biggest rock stars you have ever heard of. (laughs) No, 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 no. Vice wouldn't do that. There is definitely a theme here. Let's see if you guys can pick up the pick up on the theme of the episode. Because there's definitely an underlying theme. Our first (laughs) song is theme from Red River. (laughs) <laughs> I love that theme is in the name. This is by Dimitri Tomkin, and he also does our second song in the episode, Wagon Train from Red River. <laughs> As you might have assessed, this has something to do with the movie Red River. Maybe it's the theme from Red River. <laughs> I am so excited for this music segment because I saw what was in here and I'm like, this is going to be great. This is this. John always has these big stars or something that ties back to David Bowie. Although if this has a freaking tie back to David Bowie, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm leaving this podcast. That's <laughs> it. I'm <laughs> done. I'm out of here. <laughs> well, Dmitry Tukin is a Russian born American film composer, conductor. He was classically trained in St. Petersburg, Russia before the Bolshevik Revolution. He lived through the Bolshevik Revolution by supporting himself playing piano during silent films. In the early 1900s, this is pre-1920, you would go to see movie, but they didn't have what we like to call now in the future, talkies. (laughs) (laughs) So he did that for a while, and then he would uh, move on. He would pass around Europe. He would move to Berlin and then Paris, where he would partner with uh, his roommate, Michael Carrington, he would actually start playing piano for money. So enough so that he would move to New York with with Michael and they would get a job with a ballet troupe. He would actually meet his wife, Albertina Rash. Mm. He would do that f- with his wife for a while until basically until the stock market crashed in uh, October 1929. Work got real slow. So him and his wife moved to Hollywood where she worked to supervise dance numbers in MGM films. So she was actually hired in showbiz. And then he actually started writing for mostly small parts for MGM, kind of through his wife. His first significant score was 1933's Alice in Wonderland. Up until that point, and even at, uh, shortly after, he mostly worked on smaller projects. And he was trying hard to become a con- concert pianist. But a broken arm in 1937 fo- forced him to focus more on composing. So he would get his first break working with director Frank Coppola. Their first movie together would be Lost Horizon in 1937. He would work on other Coppola projects, including Mr. Smith Goes to Washington in 1939. 
Mm. And It's a Wonderful Life in 1946. As we started to come into the 50s, in 52, he started to get into scoring westerns. And he scored a movie called High Noon, which uh, starred Gary Cooper and Grace Kelly, who were you know huge actors at the time. And the studio actually saw it as a flat-out failure, and they didn't want to release it. So Tomkin bought the rights to the theme song, Don't Forsake Me, My Darling, a.k.a. The Ballad of High Noon. He would release the theme with singer Frankie Lane, and it would become an instant success. It would mm. be played on popular radio, and it would make be so successful that four months after it was released, the movie would be released with country western singer Tex Ritter singing the vocals. The movie would go on and get seven Academy Award nominations. It would win four Oscars, including two for Tompkins' score. Tompkins' score is largely credited for saving the movie. When you hear about music and what charted in the 50s, it's like, thank God the Beatles came in the early 60s. Like, music was in a bad place. We needed the Beatles more oh, yeah. than ever. <laughs> yeah, if you had an orchestra, you could score a hit. <laughs> He'd win two more Oscars for The High and the Mighty in 54 with John Wayne and old, The Old Man in the Sea in 58. And he would also compose for TV, including such memorable songs as 1959's Rawhide. <laughs> <laughs> That's Everyone famous. knows Rawhide. Which, which would be covered by the Blues Brothers in the scene where they're at the Cowboy Bar. And they would actually make a joke about the composer being a Ukrainian-born Jewish American. Now that <laughs> would go over the crowd's head. I don't know. Just references. References to old Dmitry Tomkin. <laughs> um, so, and he would also compose the song for the show Gunslingers. He would also make a few cameo ap uh, appearances, including attempting to help Jack Benny write a song on What's My Line and being a contestant on Groucho Marx's uh, quiz show, You Bet Your Life. Unfortunately, Dmitry Tomkin would pass away in 1979 in London. But over his career, he would compose at one point during the 50s, uh, he would compose at a rate of one movie a month. Holy shit. Continue on the theme. How about the theme from The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly by <laughs> Enjo Morricone. Obviously, the theme being from The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly. The Western he is an Italian composer, conductor, and trumpet player. Since 1946, he has composed over 500 scores for cinema and TV. <laughs> 70 of which are award-winning films, including Fistful of Dollars, The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly, Once Upon a Time in Mexico, Bugsy, In the Line of Fire, Bullworth, and most recently, The Hateful Eight. Not all award-winning. I was going to say, like, Bullworth soundtrack? <laughs> <laughs> Not all award winning. No, 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 no. I wanted to throw in some recent stuff. So the beginning was the award winning stuff. The end was uh, just, uh, hey, he's still relevant. <laughs> Morricone started playing the trumpet in jazz bands in the 1940s. He would become a studio arranger for RCA Victor and in 1955 began and ghostwriting for film and theater. He also composed music for artists such as Paul Anka and Andrea Bonicelli. Mm. From 60 to 1975, he would do uh, mostly westerns, obviously the good, the bad, and the ugly soundtrack, which would sell over 10 million records and was inducted into the Grammy Hall of Fame as one of the best-selling scores of all time. <laughs> <laughs> he would also have the soundtrack for the movie The Mission in 1986 go gold. So even in 86, man. Wow. Still still making them charts. Uh, his album Yo Yo Ma Plays Enjo Morricone lasted on the Billboard Top Classical Albums charts for 105 weeks. He's actually mixed up with some big name people. I mean, it's not the type of music that we listen to, but being linked up with Yo Yo Ma and Andrea Botticelli, like, damn, he's actually, aside from doing scores, like he's mixed up with some big time people. He would do the official theme for the 1978 FIFA World Cup. But ultimately, music has been touted as highly influential and has be, been reused in some pretty big TV series like The Sopranos 
in films like in Glorious Bastards and the Django Unchained, and also in TV shows like The Simpsons. We've got another Damn. Simpsons tie in there. <laughs> so, and as of 2013, he has sold over 70 million records. Now, that is just astounding for a guy, a composer and a conductor, basically a guy with an orchestra selling 70 million records. Yeah. So that leads us to theme from the Magnificent Seven. Yeah, are, <laughs> yeah have you guys picked up on the theme here? <laughs> the theme from the Magnificent Seven by <laughs> Elmer Bernstein. Elmer Bernstein is an American composer and conductor. Have you guys picked up on the theme? <laughs> His career spanned 50 years composing hundreds of film and TV scores, somewhere around like 200 or just over 200. His works include Magnificent Seven, The Ten Commandments, The Great Escape, To Kill a Mockingbird, Ghostbusters, Airplane, Cape Fear, Animal House, which actually revived his career and got him doing comedies. He did most of uh, John Landis's films after that, and it just goes on and on. Uh, he won an Oscar for the score to Thoroughly Modern Millie in 1967, whatever the hell that is. <laughs> He's actually nominated for 14 Oscars over the years. He actually was used to compose some of the fanfare for a lot of the National Geographic TV specials. His themes were also commonly used in Marlboro cigarette commercials. And in 1961, he co-founded Ava Record in L.A. with actor Fred Astaire, Jackie Mills, and Tommy Wolf. Damn, that's what's been yeah. crazy in this music segment is that this music wasn't just selected because of the movies it was in. It's also like some really accomplished people. Yeah, so I think what the disconnect, I think, for a lot of us is that nowadays, most TV and movie scores are popular music. Whereas, I mean, up until the 1980s, every TV show and film was scored with either an orchestra or a jazz band. Like, there was a full, you know, 50-piece band putting together music and doing all the sound cutaways behind in every TV show. So aside from having a record label with some very famous people, one of Bernstein's songs is actually also famous, the University of South Carolina's fight song, when in 1968, Paul Dietzel wrote new lyrics, Step to the Rear, becoming the fighting game box lead the way. <laughs> On a side note, University of S uh, South Carolina is one of my favorite mascots being the Gamecock. <laughs> <laughs> I want to end this segment with something else. Elmer Bernstein, he was in that era with both of the other composers that I talked about. And I think something that gets forgotten in that era is that in the 1950s, they were basically hunting communists in Hollywood. Bernstein, in the 1950s, actually was called in front of of what was called the House of Un-American Authorities Committee for music reviews that he was accused of writing for what they referred to as a commie newspaper. It actually damaged his image uh, immediately after that, and it left him working on scores for films like Robot Monster and Cat Women of the Moon until eventually... <laughs> He would do the score for Animal House and get back into doing comedies and kind of revive his career. Well, John, of course, the music segment is never what you think it's going to be. And when I hear composers for Hollywood Westerns, this is not the direction I thought we would go. Although maybe the House of Un-American Activities might be. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> And that's going to do it for us this week. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Go With The Heat. We would love to hear from you. Email us, goWithTheHeat at gmail.com. Check out that website, goWithTheHeat.com. You can find all the ways that you can contact us. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. You can find us on all of those social networks. You can get us on email. You can get us on that website. We would love to hear from you. Be sure to check out that website and find all the ways that you can subscribe to, including Stitcher, Anchor FM, Traditional RSS, Links for everything, wherever you'd want to listen to this podcast of your favorite show, Miami Vice. That is going to do it for us this week. We hope you enjoyed this episode. Be sure to check out that Patreon, patreon.com slash go with the heat. We'd love your support, and we'll see you all next time. Bye, pals. Bye.